Welcome to the third lecture on business process mining. In today's lecture, we are focusing on the concepts and capabilities of process mining. Today's lecture is a bit different than the previous ones, in the sense that we are going to show much more demonstrations with actual process mining tools. But to begin with, let's remind ourselves how does process mining work. First of all, we have process logging, followed by data collection, followed by data preparation, and then the prepared data is going to be loaded to a process mining tool in which we can apply all of the process mining techniques necessary. Now, one of the things that you remember from here is the event log. Event log holds a central place in process mining. Almost all of the process mining techniques that we are discussing rely on the existence of an event log. So we have to look at what is the structure of a business process event log. We have already seen it in the first lecture, but just as a recap, we have case identifier, which is required. We have at least one timestamp we have the name of the activity. Those three uh, data points in combination tell us that, for example, that in case 001, at this timestamp, this activity was performed. Now, there are some additional optional uh, values that we could have. For example, resource identif identifier telling us who performed that activity or process specific data. For example, case attributes and event attributes. A case attribute would be something that does not change throughout the entire process instance. Meanwhile, an event attribute is something that can potentially change after each event. For example, here we have loan goal, which is a case attribute, and also offered amount, which is an event attribute, because as we can see, it has changed throughout the course of the uh, process instance. So now that we know what is, a structure, what is the structure of a business process event log, let's take a look at how to load it in a process mining tool. Now, as mentioned in the previous lectures, in this course, we are using the process mining tool Appromore. So first of all, I have to sign in. After signing in, I am presented with my workspace where I already have some folders, I have some models, and I already have some event logs. However, for the purposes of this lecture, I'm going to click here to upload a new event log. I'm going to click Browse, and then select the event log file, and this uh, file corresponds to sepsis cases treatment, or the treatment of sepsis in a hospital. I'm going to click OK, after which this file is going to be uploaded, and I am presented with this table. In here, what the tool wants me to do is basically double check that it defined or figured out all the meanings of all my columns correctly. In this case, I have case ID, which is obviously the case ID that I want or the instance identifier. I have timestamp, which is said to be end timestamp. This is correct. I have event attributes, multiple event attributes here related to this process. I'm going to leave them as they are. However, somewhere in the end, I will also have an activity column, which I want to double check. So I have activity, activity, and this looks correct. And I also have group, resource, and this is also correct. So I'm going to click upload log. After this, I will give it a name. And once it's done, the tool tells me how many events have been processed and that the file has been imported successfully. So I can click OK and the file is right here. So now that we have uploaded an event log to a process mining tool, let's take a look at what we can actually do with that event log. One of the most common analysis types or approaches is to perform automated process discovery. This is going to provide us with a process model. So it's going to take an event log, the event log that we just uploaded, and based on the events there, it is going to produce a process map or a BPMN process model. Now, a process map is basically a directly follows graph where each activity is represented by one node and an arc from activity A to activity B means that B is directly followed by A in at least one case in the log. But let's take a look at more in detail. So first of all, we have activities. Nodes of the graphs are basically activities. So in this case, we have an activity and its frequency. So 
repair complex is performed 659 times. Then also we have to distinguish between initial activities. So these are kind of like the entry points of our process and also the final activities, which are kind of like the exit points of our process. If the initial activity is something that we do not expect, or the same goes for the final activity, then this indicates that we actually have some incomplete cases in our event log, or there is something wrong with how this process is being actually performed. Now, additionally, there is of course the directive follows relation, which in this case means that register is followed by analyze defect in 1104 cases. Then other stuff that we want to look at is for example activity self loops because those kind of indicate that something went wrong with the activity and it was repeated for some reason. For example in this case we can see that inform user in 104 cases inform user was actually repeated. In the same sense we can also look at short loops, which are kind of like possible reworks where something inform user occurred, then the repair was tested, and after the test, the user was again informed. It can be a possible, possible case of rework, but in some cases it also makes sense. And one final thing to point out is that from this graph, you can also see kind of those eventually follows relations between two activities. They are not visualized on process maps, but it is important to understand that those are also there. Then another thing to understand about process maps is that we have multiple ways of displaying information on those maps. So nodes in a process map can be colored and arcs thickness can be changed. And this allows us to capture, for example, frequency, how often a given activity or directly follows a relation occurs, or duration, processing times, cycle times, waiting times, and so forth, or other attributes. And this kind of coloring and thickness of lines helps us when doing anal analysis so that it kind of draws our eye to more common aspects of the process. So now let's take a look at how it actually looks in Uppermore. In Uppermore, we now have the same view as we had before, and our uploaded event log is right here. The easiest way to see the process map from this event log is to just double click on it. This opens a new tab, and the process map is automatically displayed for us. Here we can see that we have ER registration, followed by ER triage, followed by ER sepsis triage, we can see the frequencies. We can see the frequencies of the directly follows relations. We can also see the choice, po uh, choice points in the process and so forth until the very end of the process. And for example, in here, we can see that we have multiple exit points. Some of those make sense, but there is one that is return ER, which kind of means that the patient returned after treatment for whatever reason. Depending on the specifics of the process, this might be okay, but this also might indicate that it's something where the treatment was, for example, unsuccessful. Now, I also showed the BPMN map, so this can be very easily found from here, where we can just click on this button, and the same map is going to be transformed into the BPMN equivalent. Now, before moving on to the next part of this lecture, I'm going to point out that we already also have here log statistics, so the number of cases that we have in the given event log, case variants, so the number of unique sequences of events, activity instances, so how many activities in this data set were actually performed, and how many activities there are, like unique activities. We also have temporal statistics, case duration, which basically means cycle time and also the log time frame. So when was the first event and when was the last event? But now let's move on to the next part of this lecture where we are going to discuss the potential complexity issues of process maps and how to deal with those issues.